Hello, health champions. Today, I'm going to go over the science of losing belly fat with breathing exercises. And this is not a something for nothing. And if you understand it and you apply it properly, it can make the difference between losing weight or not. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. Now I'm going to go over five different principles, five different steps about how this science works. And if you don't catch all the five steps, then it's not going to make sense. Okay. You've got to get all of them. And if you do, then it's going to really come together beautifully for you. And make sure then that you stay to the end because I've got a great bonus for you. So whether you have belly fat to lose or not, then knowing this information could totally change your life. So I know what you're thinking. Is this for real? There's so much talk about belly fat being dangerous and you need to cut the sugar and you need to exercise and you do crunches and so forth. How could breathing have anything to do with it? So it is absolutely real and you've got to sort of understand the whole picture. But before we get into it, I just want to emphasize some common sense. And I know that you guys watching this are really smart. That's why you're on this channel that in order to get a whole healthy body, we can't just do one thing and ignore everything else. There's not like one thing can make up for the other stuff. So there's no quick fix. This video is not called learn how to breathe a little bit and wake up with a flat belly. Okay. That would be insulting your intelligence. So just understand that you have to have a good diet, whole food, not producing too much insulin. You got to have proper sleep, enough sleep, good quality, and you have to exercise, not to burn calories, but to activate the body, to give the brain some signals and create some circulation and some good hormones in the body. With that said, it, the breathing is a fantastic add on, but it can't be the only thing that you do. There is no quick fix. This, these problems take years or decades to develop. So you're not going to just flip a switch. And, and be done with it. All right. But you, you guys know that. So the very first thing we need to understand is where belly fat comes from. All right. It doesn't happen. It doesn't end up on the belly randomly. There's a reason we have different hormones. We have different mechanisms that have different results. And belly fat is a result of two hormones called cortisol and insulin. Insulin is a hormone that rises in response to blood sugar. It takes the blood sugar out of the bloodstream, puts it inside the cell and in the presence of cortisol, then it's going to end up specifically around the midsection. And we know this because there's a disease called Cushing's. These people have a pathology of some sort that produces astronomical amounts of cortisol. And as a result, they have a very characteristic body shape. They have a huge belly, they have a flat butt, they have skinny legs and they have a big hump on their neck. They have a, a moon face and all these things are because of cortisol and cortisol in turn drives insulin. So these, the hormones work together, but we know because of that, that this big belly is because of cortisol and insulin. So now we know where belly fat comes from. Now we need to understand how does cortisol end up being so high. Assuming that we don't have Cushing's, which fortunately it's very rare. So most of you by far are not going to have Cushing's. It's not going to be pathological. It's going to be high because of lifestyle. And the thing that cortisol results from is stress. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And why does that happen? Well, anytime that you have stress, then your body is anticipating having to do something. 
it's anticipating having to respond to something or to defend itself against something. And when that happens, when you're threatened or attacked, then your body is going to need more energy. You're going to have to run really fast for a while to get, get away from the danger and that requires energy. And cortisol is produced during an emergency, during a stress event, because cortisol raises blood sugar. And blood sugar is the emergency fuel, right? Your baseline metabolism runs mostly on fat and that's how your body likes it. Slow exercise and walking is mostly fat, especially if you're fat adapted. But during an emergency, your body knows, hey, we're going to need some extra. That fat is great, but it's not going to be enough because we can, we can burn fat in the presence of oxygen. But once you start huffing and puffing and you reach a critical threshold, in order to go above that, you have to have glucose. You have to have carbohydrates. So that's why it's the emergency fuel because carbohydrates, glucose, can be split and can create energy without oxygen. That's where you get the lactic acid. So it's for short-term bursts and it's absolutely essential. It will save your life. So there are two ways that your body can raise blood sugar. So when you have a stress response, then your body will raise cortisol, that's one way, and the other is to make you eat sugar, all right? That's why you get cravings when you're stressed. Because your body says, hey, this is stressful, I'm gonna have to do hard work, give me some more fuel, let's ramp up the fuel just in case. So stress creates cortisol. Now, what is it that manages stress? How do we balance and regulate stress in the body? How does that work? There's something called the autonomic nervous system. And here's your third principle. The autonomic nervous system manages everything about you that you don't have to think about. So your, your digestion, your heartbeat, your breathing, your, your circulation, your hormones, your pH. All of those things are managed by your autonomic nervous system. And it is a resource allocation system, okay? The body has limited resources, there's only so much. So if you have resources over here and then the body senses we're gonna need more resources over here, you have to pull, you have to borrow from one place and reallocate them to the other. And this is what that system does. So. If let's say that you're at a picnic and you're having a good time, you're relaxed, then that's one type of resource allocation. And then you're sitting there enjoying your food, digesting it, making lots of nice stomach acid and digestive enzymes. But then a grizzly bear shows up and wants to join your picnic. Now you're not so relaxed anymore. So you quickly go from a parasympathetic state into a sympathetic, from a relaxed state to a fight-flight state. So the sympathetic is known as your fight-flight system. The parasympathetic is known as your feed-breed or rest-digest system. So why does it switch? Because you don't need the blood in your gut to digest the food. You need it in your muscles to get away from the bear. So your body reallocates and the first thing that happens is you make adrenaline. And in a split second, you have adrenaline rushing through your blood. And as a result, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up. So you can send more blood out to the muscles so you can run and fight, climb a tree, get out of there. And then at the same time or a few seconds later, your cortisol goes up like we talked about so that you can make more blood sugar, more glucose, so that you can make it, so you can maintain that escape a little bit longer. And this activity is also known as catabolic, meaning breakdown, because your body doesn't care about long-term health. It will burn bridges, it will break down protein, it will do whatever it can to get out of there. Right? You don't even feel pain. You can get scratches while you're running through the thorny bushes 
and you don't notice until later because your body has just one priority to get out of there. The opposite is called the parasympathetic, your feed breed, and it is responsible for digestion. It is powered primarily by something called the vagus nerve that goes from your brainstem to your gut, and it's only with parasympathetic activation that we can digest food. The blood doesn't get to the gut without parasympathetic activation. Your immune system, your cell-based immune system that fights off infections, it doesn't get activated unless you have some parasympathetic activity. Your reproductive function doesn't work if you're stressed. Your healing doesn't work if you're stressed. So the parasympathetic is responsible for all anabolic function, all the buildup, all the tissue repair, all making new tissues and new body parts and better body parts is the parasympathetic. It only happens when you're relaxed. So the way we want to think about this is like a seesaw, that when one increases, the other decreases. Right? So both of these are essential, but the sympathetic always comes first, always gets first priority. Because if you don't make it through the next few seconds, who cares about what might have worked tomorrow or next month? So parasympathetic is always put on the back burner. The sympathetic is super fast, the parasympathetic is much slower, and it only kicks in after the sympathetic has settled down. And this becomes important as we're going to see. So now that we understand all of this, we also understand the real reason why they call belly fat bad. Why do they call it dangerous? Okay, is the fat dangerous? No, fat is just fat. The reason it's dangerous is because of what put it there, what hormones and what circumstances put it there. And if you have belly fat, it's a result of cortisol. If cortisol is high, then you have had your digestion decreased, your immune system decreased, your reproduction decreased, and your healing decreased. That's why they call it dangerous, because the people with the belly fat are sick because they don't have enough parasympathetic function. Number four, now we're getting to the really cool stuff. So, did you know that when you breathe in, your heart speeds up? When you breathe out, your heart slows down, for real. And you can verify this. If you have a heart rate monitor or you have one of these little pulse ox things, then just start breathing really slow and you will notice that it's faster on the in-breath and it's slower on the out-breath. And there's going to be a little bit of a delay because whatever readout it kind of averages and it gives you a few seconds after, but you'll start to see this pattern. And here's the thing, when you breathe in, that's a sympathetic activity, that's just a little bit of stress. And when you breathe out, that activates the parasympathetic nervous system, that's a sign that you're relaxing. And like we said before, the sympathetic kicks in really fast. So every time you breathe in, you already have a little bit of sympathetic activity. But the parasympathetic is much slower. So if you just kind of breathe out for a second or two, you just take, then that's not enough time for that parasympathetic nervous system to activate. So what happens is you activate sympathetic with the out breath, but then you don't get any parasympathetic activation. So with a short, shallow breath and lots of stress, you just kind of add on to that sympathetic activity. You gotta slow down the breath. You gotta breathe out for about five to six seconds to allow that parasympathetic nervous system time to engage because it's that much slower. So once you understand this, now we've got the breathing tied in to the balance of your autonomic nervous system. And if you find a nice, slow, relaxing breath that we're gonna describe in a moment, then you can balance your nervous system. All right, how cool is that? But then a lot of people will object and say, oh sure, that's really cool, we can start changing things, but how does that help me? I have a busy life, 
I can breathe for five minutes here and there, but I can't spend my whole life breathing. What is that supposed to do for me, right? And that's a good point. And in order to understand how to get around that, we need to understand number five, which is neuroplasticity. And this is so hyper cool. It means that your brain is always changing. It's plastic. It's rewiring itself. They used to think of the brain sort of like bone, that it was just there. The, the cells were where they were and they might replace a few molecules here and there, but it kind of was what it was. They knew that the brain sort of changed while kids were growing, but they thought that as soon as you were sort of teenager or adult, then it locked in forever. And that was the belief for a very long time. But there were some people who did pioneering work and research and they had to really struggle to get their ideas through. And this research started in the 1960s and continued in the 70s and 80s. But it's as recent as 1980, 1990s that we even understand and, and accept the concept of neuroplasticity, that the brain changes. And why is this cool? Because it means that if you can learn something at the age of 80, if you can learn how to use a cell phone, if you can learn a new language, if you can learn a new skill or a hobby or a new card game, that means that you can rewire your brain, right? Every new thing that you learn means that you rewire your brain. You are physically reconnecting, you're breaking up old wires and contacts and you're pulling them off and putting them in new places. You're creating new neural networks at any age. So your brain isn't set, it becomes what you make it. So once we understand that, then we understand that we can change the balance of sympathetic parasympathetic. The vast majority of people are stuck in sympathetic. There's so many things in daily life, like the screaming kids and the bills and the news and the traffic that puts us in that fight flight response. And it doesn't matter if it's a real bear or an imagined bear, we're still gonna have that stress response. So most people are kind of stuck, but if we understand neuroplasticity, then we understand that with the principles we learned about breathing, we can change it, right? So when you breathe in, you're activating sympathetics, you're strengthening the areas in the brain that mediate that sympathetic response. When you're breathing out, you're strengthening, you're activating your parasympathetic and you're strengthening the area that handles parasympathetic. And these are physical locations that will grow if you do this. They're physical pathways. They're like wires in your spinal cord and, and in your brain, and you can change them. So we wanna understand that every skill you have, the languages you speak, the way you walk, the things you know how to do at work, the way you catch a ball, they're all neurological pathways. They're all patterns in your nervous system. So think of these skills as neurological habits. And think about a pianist and a piano, right? So some people say, oh, well, I just can't change. I am the way I am. Well, that's not true. If you understand how a pianist has practiced, they have developed a skill and they're so good at it that they can sit down and play something and they can think about something else. They can have a conversation. They could mentally be somewhere else, but that skill is so strong, it's so automated that it sort of goes by itself. That's what you wanna do with your sympathetic and parasympathetic. You can practice it to get to that point, but it's not gonna happen overnight, obviously, right? You're not gonna sit down to a piano and hit a few notes and say, oh, okay, I guess this didn't work for me because I don't sound like that guy. It's, it's a habit, it's repetition, repetition, repetition. So how much do you have to practice to automate this? 
the more you do, the better you get. So I would suggest you breathe, you sit down, you relax, you do your breathing exercise about five minutes at a time, maybe 10, and you do it once or twice a day, right? And in one week, you'll make just a tiny little bit of progress. If you do it once, nothing's gonna happen. You feel good for five minutes. After a week, you'll start moving. After a month, you'll get a whole lot better. After six months or 12 months, you'll be a concert pianist. You'll be the, an expert. You'll be the equivalent of a, of a pianist. At that point, you can go through your life you can fight traffic, you can manage your kids, you can have a boss scream at you, and you still, your, your patterns, your pathways are so strong that you stay in balance. You don't get stressed, you don't make cortisol, you don't make belly fat, okay? And that is what it's gonna take. This is how you develop a healthy body, is you develop some good habits and you do them over time. So how do you do this breathing? Well, there's all kinds of breathing philosophies and patterns and techniques out there. And they're all good for something, okay? Just try them, see if they do something for you. But to balance your sympathetics, parasympathetics, the way we're talking about, it's about smoothness and it's about having about an equal pattern of breathing in and out. If anything, you just make your out breath about one second longer. So think about five seconds in and five or six seconds out. That's gonna be slow enough for the parasympathetic to kick in. And think of it as a smooth wave. Okay, so you start breathing in very, very slowly and you don't force it. You, you start with the belly and then you let it rise very, very gently into the chest. So it's not a full breath. Your shoulders stay perfectly relaxed. As soon as you start pulling up your shoulders, that's a stress response, right? So very slow breath in, let it rise into the chest. And then at the top of the breath, there's gonna be a moment where nothing happens and you're not sure if you're breathing in or out, but just wait a little bit and all of a sudden you notice you're breathing out. And then same thing at the bottom of the breath, you let the breath out the bottom there's a moment you don't know if you're breathing in or out but before you know it you're breathing in again and this should be so silent that if someone had their ear to your nose they wouldn't hear a thing that's basically it's a very calm very slow breath it should be a tiny little bit deeper than a shallow breath but it's nowhere near a maximal breath it's not about filling your lungs at all Congratulations for sticking around this far. The bonus is that not only are you gonna reduce belly fat, like we talked about from reducing cortisol, but when you balance your autonomic nervous system, when you start improving your parasympathetic function, you will get better nutrition. How does that work? A lot of people come into my office and they write down, what, it, what are you interested in? better nutrition. They think that it's all about learning the right foods to eat. And yes, that's important. You want to put good food rather than junk food. But what if your digestion is so poor? What if you're parasympathetic? What if you have no blood flow to your gut and you put really awesome food in there and you only absorb a fraction of the nutrients, right? You're still not going to be healthy. So yeah, you want to eat the right stuff, but what if you can actually send some blood to the gut and absorb a higher percentage of those nutrients? How about not getting colds and flus anymore? I used to get colds and flus a couple of three times a year, and sometimes in the fall I would get a really bad cough for three weeks and then it would stick around for, for several months after that. Well, for the last three to four years, I haven't had a cold or a flu or a fever, not even a sniffle. And part of that is good nutrition, good food, and the other part is learning to balance your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. It's really cool to have all these sniffling people around you and know that you're not gonna get it. Another bonus is improved libido. 
right? Your body does not prepare for procreation if you're stressed, if you're being chased by a bear. That's not the first thing that comes to mind. So when you get balance in your body, your libido will improve. That's why they talk about stress causing all these problems. That's the mechanism that the stress shuts down your parasympathetic nervous system and you just lose that function. You bring the parasympathetic back, all this stuff comes back. You will sleep better because when you wake up in the middle of the night and your mind is racing, that's usually adrenaline and cortisol along with a stressed mind that won't shut off. You will have improved recovery. The parasympathetic is responsible for the relaxed peripheral circulation that improves oxygenation and healing. So you'll recover from exercise, you'll recover from injuries faster. And if you have a disease you'd like to reverse, then healing and anabolic function repair it's basically only going to happen with a functioning parasympathetic nervous system. How's that for bonuses? If you feel you learned something from this video, then you will definitely like that one too. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.